uh, now, let me introduce you all to the resource speaker for today. We have with us Ms. Tobilova Ajayi. She is a founder, author, advocate, disability management with over 12 years of experience in working with various disability management organization in different countries. She has a law degree in Nigeria as well as a master's degree in international law. She's founded the organization Red Cerebral Policy Kids Foundation to promote inclusive mainstream education for children with cerebral palsy in Nigeria in 2007 and supported over 450 children and enabled over 95 children to access inclusive education. She's also also trained over 500 teachers to address the knowledge and skill gap. She's also a six-time published author who believes strongly in the power of words to create a change in perception and realities. It's a pleasure to have you here with us, Storia, ma'am. And who better than you to take us through the UDL, the Universal Design for Learning, to support our educators to become a great teachers in their respective classes. I'd like to share with all our members that the session would be for one hour's time. The session would begin with a presentation followed by a QA and a discussion. If your fellow friends are not able to join us on the Zoom, also share with them the link of the Facebook Live, which is being streamed right now. The link is being shared right now in the chat box for all of you to view. Now I hand over the podium to you, ma'am. It's all yours. We are all open to learn. All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Depending on where you're listening and watching from, it's actually a great pleasure to be here. And I'm looking. Um, let's keep the let's keep the conversations going in the chat box. I will be sharing my screen now so we can get started. Um, please let me know that you can see my screen. So that I can be sure that we're all on the same page. Yes, ma'am, we're able to see your screen. Great. All right, great. All right. So I will be reading the chat box. How many of us have heard about universal design for learning before today? Okay. So I have heard about universal design for learning before today. I'm saying no, not yet heard. Okay, a few people have heard about it. I'm saying not yet. Okay, first time today, good. Right, so we're going to have a fantastic conversation. So today we're gonna to be talking about how to teach students with different challenges in a classroom setting, using universal design for learning to become a great teacher. Um, I don't know how many teachers or educators are in the room, but if you're an educator or a classroom teacher in the room, you're going to be able to relate with some of the things I'm about to say. So I live in Nigeria and I went to school all my life until graduate school in Nigeria. So the average classroom size, when I went to a private school, my average classroom size was about 35 students in the class. And then when I got to secondary school, which is um, the American equivalent of high school, I went to a public school and then the class size went up from 35 to almost 90. So that class was large. So the question was, and in my class of 90, there were at least six to seven of us with obvious learning differences. Now that's minus all of the other students that might have had learning differences that were not very obvious to the naked eye. But even just in the class, the ones that you could easily point out, there was at least seven of us. So you can imagine how much work it was for my teacher to make sure that all of us were learning. I mean, she had over 90 students in the class. So if you can relate with me, let me know this in the chat box. Okay. Yeah. Right, so I can see that you guys are, yeah, there's so many people that can relate with this. <laughs> so many people that can relate with large class sizes. Great. Okay, so let's go on. How do we then teach students with different challenges in these large classrooms that we have? All right. Today we're going to look at the diverse needs 
needs of children in the classroom. So we're going to look at the possible diverse needs you will meet in the class. And the common difficulties faced by teachers when they have to teach these diverse classrooms. And then we'll definitely look at universal design for learning and its application in your class. So these are the three things that we're gonna look at today. I only have about 30 to 35 minutes. So we're going to try to make this fast. But if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat box and I will take them. All right, so first of all, let's talk about diversity in the classroom. Let's, any classroom teacher here knows this that your classroom, irrespective of how homogeneous you try to make it, is already diverse. If there are, even if you're a parent, the minute you have more than one child, you're already dealing with diversity. So diversity in your classroom is the deliberate process of including and involving people from a different range of experiences and ensuring that they all learn together. And so that, Diversity is not just about disability, it's also about gender, ethnicity, race, and of course, disability. So today we're going to be focusing more on disability, of course, but understand that your class is already diverse if you already have children from different genders in your class, different races, different ethnicities within the same race, you already have a diverse class. All right. Research has shown that in any given classroom, on any given day, there's at least one child or one student with a difference in the classroom. Now, if you have up to 20 students in the class, I can bet you that on any given day, you have at least four students who have a difference in that classroom. And there could be differences in terms of physical appearance, Differences in interests and preferences, differences in skill sets, differences in capacity, differences in learning needs. So in your class, if you have a minimum of 20 students, I can bet with you that you already have four students in that class who have learning needs. And it's important that you, you come into the class as an educator and even as a parent. I mean, if you're a parent and you have two kids, Trust me, you're already dealing with diversity and your children are going to learn differently. So it is important that you come into the learning experience and the teaching experience with that mindset, being clear that there is already diversity in your classroom. So what is your role as a teacher in a diverse class? Your first role is to model behavior. So if you want students to respect each other and to accept individual differences, you have to model it as the teacher. You have to show students how to do it in the way that you, you relate with the students in the classroom. I was saying at a different training yesterday that children will do what you do, not what you say. So you can write all of the beautiful rules and these are our class rules and this is our class behavior and you can have a really beautiful decorated board with all of these rules on it but if you are not acting it out as the classroom teacher then the students are not going to be doing it so you have to model behavior that respects and accepts individual differences the other thing you need to do is to encourage your students and learners to notice the way in which everyone is different and to think of ways in which they can celebrate that difference and support each other to succeed. And while they're doing that, also encourage them to find areas in which they're similar. So it might just be something as simple as, oh, you're both girls and you both like pink. That's a, an area of commonality that can easily overshadow all the areas of difference because children really, I always say, are the biggest drivers of inclusion they see commonality before they see difference, unless adults teach them different. So what are the unique needs of children with special needs in your class? I'm not going to give you an exhaustive list because I can't, but I will give you a short list of the common needs that are found that are unique to children with special needs in classrooms. Some children will need one-on-one -on -one support um, if you listen to my bio, you will know that I work with children with cerebral palsy, and so that's a very common need in the community that I work in. A lot of the children that we work with, we will need one-on-one -on -one support in the classroom. And so as a teacher, that might be something you want to think about. 
some children will need frequent breaks. They cannot, um, they cannot sit for too long in one position. Some children, a good number of children will need curriculum modifications. Some children, children with sensory processing disorder and maybe autism, who need a safe sensory space. And then of course, a lot of children will also need accommodations to help them show what they know. So quick question. Uh, does anyone in accommodation? If you know, put it in the chat box and I'll read it out. The difference between a modification and an accommodation. Read in the chat. Let's see. Okay, so tell me. I see someone who says yes. You know the difference between a modification and an accommodation. So please type it into the chat box and I'll read it out for everyone. Okay. Okay, all right. Okay, so I like that. So modifications are changes to the curriculum or the expected learning outcomes for a particular student or group of students. Accommodations are changes to how children show what they know. So with a modification, you are not changing you, with a modification, you're changing the curriculum or the expected output from a student. With an accommodation, the student is doing exactly the same thing that their peers are doing, but they're just showing it in a different way. So some students will need modifications and some students will need accommodations. So it's very important that you know who needs what. So you don't assume that every student needs a modification or assume that every student needs an accommodation. It's important that you know who needs what in your classroom. All right, so let's move on. Okay. All right. What's your role as a teacher? You need to understand the unique challenges that every child in your class faces. And when you understand it, and that's, this is the place of an IEP. If you, if you have a child with special needs in your class, that child should have an individualized education plan that helps you understand their unique challenges. In understanding the unique challenges, what you're trying to do is to gain insight into how these challenges affect the child. When you gain that insight, your job is to prepare to support the needs of the child in the classroom without disrupting your learning process. So that's why it's important to, first of all, understand that there's diversity in the class and figure out how to make sure that while you're supporting the needs of the students, you're not disrupting the learning process for everybody else. And I understand that this sounds like a lot of work for teachers. I, it's it's not easy at all. And I'm not going to sit here and say that it's easy because it can be incredibly challenging, especially if you have a large class to do all of these things that I've highlighted before. What are some of the challenges that teachers face in the classroom? Okay, so I have a few here, but I would like for teachers to also put in the chat box some of the challenges that they're facing in their classroom to include children with special needs. Some of the challenges I'm very aware of, the biggest one is usually a rigid curriculum. In Nigeria, where I live and work, even when teachers want to modify the curriculum so that they can meet the learning needs, of, there's this curriculum outcome that is expected and it's so rigid that it makes it difficult for teachers to even try to modify the curriculum. And then of course, there's also the lack of sufficient support staff, support students with diverse needs. And so the teachers are you know, stretched to their maximum, they're stretched thin. I mean, imagine if you have a class of 35 students and you have five students with special needs to support and you don't have support staff, teachers are going to burn out. And so that's a huge need. And then I do not know about you guys, but in Nigeria, teacher training is completely inadequate. Most of the time, because teacher training is um, 
it's segregated into two in Nigeria. So there is the Colleges of Education Special, and then there's the College of Education Regular. So, um, special, so special education teachers are supposed to go to the College of Education Special. So the minute that someone is doesn't attend a special education school, they think that it's not their job to teach children with special needs. And so we have teachers in mainstream classrooms who are not equipped because in their entire um, education to become teachers, they probably took only one module in special education, which definitely does not equip them with the skills that they need to teach children with special needs. And then of course, oh goodness, the African society can be prejudicial towards people with special needs. And this carries on into the school because it is the people who are in the society that are in the schools, right? So you find stigma as an issue, you find prejudice. Um, I've had situations where parents would come into a school and say to the um, school management, oh, I don't want that child with special needs sitting near my child, or I don't want my child with special needs sharing a desk with that, even with um, children with special needs, right? So you find other parents of other children with special needs saying, I don't want that particular child sharing a desk with my child. So there's a lot of stigma and prejudice. And then we also find that sometimes parents do not support the work that the teachers are doing. So they frustrate the teacher's move to include the child. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I've covered all the challenges. So I'm going to be checking the chat box to see if there's any other thing. Hmm. I see lack of expertise. Yeah, so I see lack of expertise, interesting, as a challenge. And I agree with you, lack of teacher training is a huge challenge. Huh, somebody says, so parents live in denial. I absolutely agree with you. And so they will frustrate everything that you're trying to do to support their children. I see lack of parental support, lack of training, fantastic. These are the same things that I've noticed here. Uh, Huh, parents who fail to acknowledge that their kids need help. Hmm, infrastructure. Ha, huh. uneducated parents, parents in denial. Okay, I need to have a conversation with the ability team because I think we need to have a conversation with parents, specifically with parents. Ha, huh. ethnic and religious differences. I totally see that. That happens a lot. Mm hmm. Okay, somebody said inclusion is expensive. That's also true. Yes, so those are some of the challenges that as teachers you're going to face. And I hear a lot of you saying parents are in denial, parents are unsupportive. Okay, we hear you. We're going to have to have a conversation with these parents. It's important that we do. Um, Let's of today. Let's decode universal design. Universal design is a term that originally started in architecture. It was used to describe the composition of a space of an environment so that it can be accessed, used, and understood to the greatest extent possible without the need for modifications, for adaptations, or any specialized equipment by the most number of people. So architectural design that is universally designed is a space that everyone can access without needing anything special. That's a simple way to describe it. So an example of universal design, I always say is the evolution of doors, right? There was a time when we had doors that had um, handles that were kind of circular. So you needed to be able to twist your wrist to be able to open those doors. And then we went from those doors to doors that you all you had to do was bend the handle. So you didn't need to twist, you didn't need to twist your wrist in a circle. You just had to bend the handle. Those were easier because even if you had limited wrist um, motion, you could still open doors. But the ultimate evolution in universally designed doors were the automatic doors. So you didn't need any help to get through the door. Whether you were on a wheelchair, whether you had limited hand function, it didn't matter. Whether you were even carrying a huge bag, you once you got to the door, the door opened. That was the evolution. That's an example of the evolution of universal design 
indoors. Now, education borrowed from design and said, we need to design learning experiences and spaces in a way that they can be accessed, understood, and used to the greatest extent possible in an independent and natural manner without the need for modifications, adaptations, or specialized solutions. So what UDL tries to do is to make sure that we are designing lessons from scratch in a way that enables everybody to learn without the need for these modifications we spoke about earlier or the accommodations or specialized IEPs or adaptations to the curriculum to the greatest extent possible. I usually say that when you design with UDL, you will meet the learning needs of at least 80% of your classroom. You will still probably have a 20% that needs specialized instruction or that need IEPs or that still need modifications, but at least 80% of the learning needs in your classrooms will be met with UDL. All right, let's take a quick poll. Let's take a quick poll. Do you think that universal design is applicable to every classroom? So you're going to have a poll pop up. I'm just launching the poll, Matt. Audience, you'll see right. the poll on your screen. Just choose your so, answer. So please choose your answer. I'm going to be choosing mine. <laughs> please choose your answers on the poll. So ma'am, we'll keep it open for another 20 seconds. We have like okay. half the participants who responded. So the other right. half in the meeting can start responding. So that we okay. Pick yeah. Uh, the last 10 seconds. So people who have not responded, quickly take a minute, okay. quickly take a brief second and respond. It's all there. You'll be able to find the poll screen on the side if it is not visible to you on the screen. By clicking on it, you'll have the poll tab. Right. Yeah, so I'm gonna end the poll and share the results with you, ma'am. All right, yay! Most 80% of our participants, this is beautiful. 80% of our participants actually think that universal design for learning is applicable to every classroom, and just 20% thinks not. So I think that we can go on now because we all agree that UDL is applicable to every classroom. Huh, interesting. So let's go on. Right. What does the research say about UDL? The application of UDL in lesson planning and implementation will improve the quality of the learner's learning process. UDL engages your learners and helps them think creatively. And actually, I think, I strongly believe that UDL does more for even teachers in teaching and thinking creatively by presenting the content in multiple ways. UDL also helps your children to build knowledge and develop skills by catering to their unique strengths and to their unique learning needs. Ah, what are the principles of UDL? I always say that UDL sits on three major principles. One, multiple means of representation. This means that as a teacher in lesson planning, you're planning your lesson in a way that you're gonna present your, you're gonna present whatever topic it is that you're teaching for every topic in multiple ways. I always ask that teachers present their lessons in at least four ways to ensure that every child has at least one access point to that lesson, to the curriculum. 
So that's the first principle of UDL, multiple means of representation. So as a teacher, you're presenting your lesson in multiple ways. The second principle of UDL is multiple means of engagement. This means that you're, you're giving your learners multiple ways to engage with the lesson. I always say again, have at least four ways for students to engage with the lesson. If you've presented the lesson in four ways, then they should have at least four ways to engage with the lesson as well. And then the third principle is multiple means of action and expression. Students must be given multiple ways of showing you what they know. It would be almost criminal for you to present a lesson in four ways and only give students one option to show you how they know it. So it's important that we understand that the three principles of UDL are multiple means of representation, multiple means of engagement, and multiple means of expression. Now let's talk about what the possible access points for learning are. I always say to make learning easier for all students, especially when you're designing a UDL lesson plan, understand the four dominant learning styles and plan your lesson using them as a guide. Uh, the acronym for the four dominant learning styles is VARC, V-A-R-K. The V stands for the visual learner, the A for the auditory learner, the R for the read and write learner, and the K for the kinesthetic learner. So plan your lessons using this four access point for learning. All right, so this is a visual that shows you an example of what the act of what the learning styles can look like. Your visual learner learns by seeing, your auditory learner learns by hearing, your read and write learner learns by reading and writing, and your kinesthetic learner learns by doing. So that's, this is how to present, these are the four access points that you should give in every lesson. So does this sound impossible to do? Ha. Ah. So let's see, let's start with one access point. How can you teach children using any of the four access points on the previous slide? Let's discuss this in the chat box. I would say pick something that you don't usually use. So if you're a teacher who's used to using visual cues, don't talk to me about visual cues. Pick an access point that you're not very familiar with and think about how you can use that to teach a lesson. I will be reading the comments in the chat box. Hmm. I see somebody saying videos. So somebody saying visual schedules and flashcards. That's simply visual learning. Creative writing, hmm, if you read and write, videos. Everybody's talking about visuals. What's happening to my read and write learners? Role playing, thank you. Writing scripts, thank you. PowerPoints, that's still visual learning. Okay, games, great. Experimentation, fantastic. Sand play, charts, demonstration, peer group playing, quizzes, thank you. Integrations, hands on activities, games, field trips. Thank you. Who was that? Somebody said field trips. That's just fantastic. Exhibits, great job. PowerPoint, yeah, that's common. Experiments, hmm, I like that. Film showings, <laughs> this is great. Music, great. Interviews, fantastic. Hmm. Dancing. Ha, I would love to see that class. Show and tell, great. Uh huh. Dramatizing, reading by recording, great. So I'm, I'm seeing that we're all, I like the fact that we're all thinking out of the box. Now the question is, all of these beautiful things that we're typing in the chat box, how many of us are actually using them every day in the classroom? That's the question. Because it's easy to write it all out, but it then has to, it then has to translate from not just something that we're saying that sounds good, that has a sound bite to it, to something that we're using every single day in how we plan our lessons. So I'm beginning to 
round up now. So let's talk about my key, ta art, key takeaways from this lesson. One, students learn differently and they require different methods of learning instruction. And then universal design for learning offers practical recommendations to assist effective classroom preparation and planning to support the diverse needs of students in learning. Research shows that when students are given multiple access points to learning, at least 80% of the students' learning needs are met without the need for any special adaptation or changes. UDL makes learning easier and improves learning outcomes for all learners and in every single classroom. So, thank you. I will be taking questions now. Uh, so yeah, I will be handing back over to Rivati for us to take questions. Thank you so much, ma'am, for making it very, very simple for us and also eliciting all the principles of UDL and making it so relatable for our audience and how it can be applied to our classrooms here. Thank you so much. Before we begin with the q and I'd like to share a little things with our audience today. If you could stop sharing, ma'am. Thanks. So dear participants, I've seen a lot of messages on the chat asking for the recording of today's session and the slide decks along with the resources. I'm going to share where is that you can find all of it. So this is the place where you'll find all the materials with regarding to today's session. With that of your slide deck, your resources and the recording, please note that the recording will be available on this page two to three days post the event. The link for accessing the events takeaway page is being shared right now in the chat box. Do save the link and also don't forget to share it with anyone who you think would benefit from it. If you scroll down, you'll also find all our upcoming events. Do check out the upcoming events and don't forget to register yourself for our upcoming events because we have very, very limited slots available. I'd like to reiterate to all our participants that you can join Hands with Ability community to spread awareness, to share about our certificate programs, which are crafted by experts uh, to support children with special needs. You can create and share resources over our platform. We already have about 400 resources which are available on our platform to improve outcomes of children with special needs. And also you can become an inclusion champion to advocate the mission of ability and bring positive change to the world. Now, I'd like to reiterate to y'all that we have two upcoming events in the month of February, which would be beginning with that of building comprehension skills in children with special needs to help them formulate academic intervention, which would be conducted by Madam Geeta Gopi N, which would be happening on the 3rd of February at 4.30 p.m. Indian time, 6 p.m. Indonesian time, 7 p.m. Singapore and Philippines time. Following that, we have another session on understanding ADHD in classrooms, home, and other social setting, which would be happening on the 10th of February at 4.30 p.m. Indian time, 6 p.m. Indonesian time, 7 p.m. Singapore and Philippines time. This session would be conducted by Ms. Shivani Vatva. The link to register is also being shared right now in the chat box. Don't forget to share this link with anyone who you think would benefit from it. By sharing the link, we can forward the care to others and a lot of people can be benefited to support children with special needs better. Now, we can begin with our Q&A session for today, ma'am. Are you ready to take your first question? Absolutely. Yes. So, ma'am, uh, we have one question from Ms. Rosaline, who wants to know, uh, there is a lot of difference between the traditional way of teaching and the applying the UDL principles of teaching. So, what are certain things that educators need to keep in mind while planning and also implementing UDL practices in their respective classroom setting? If you could show some, throw some light on it. Right. So I think that the biggest difference between how you traditionally plan lessons and plan a UDL lesson is that you're thinking about the four access points to the curriculum. So you are ensuring that there is a visual component to the lesson. There's an auditory component to the lesson. There's a read and write component to the lesson. And there's a kinesthetic component to the lesson. And not just in delivery, but in engagement and even in assessment or exams or tests, whatever you call it. So it's important that we're thinking around that in lesson planning. So the entire gamut of lesson planning, including planning your time. So if you know that you have 45 minutes for a lesson, you have to think about how you're going to manage the time while still ensuring that there's a visual component, there's an auditory component, there's a read and write component, and there's a kind aesthetic component. 
Thank you so much, ma'am. So while planning only making I sure hope that, that helps. yeah, planning only making sure that all the four access points are met too. Next, we have a question because you mentioned about assessment. This is a question from Ms. Rhoda who wants to know, is there any difference in the assessment process while using an UDL approach? And do you personally think the assessment should be a uniform one for all children or should it be catered to different children based on their needs differently? What is your take on it? So my take is that for assessment, it's basically about creating options. So um, a good example of how this is done in Nigerian setting is um, you would see you see an exam question that would say um, there are six questions. Answer any four, or you hear the six questions. Answer any four. Question one is compulsory. Now, if you're going to set questions like that. Always make sure that for your compulsory question, there is there are all the four access points in that question. So there is the option to either draw something or explain something or show something in multiple ways. You cannot have taught a lesson in four ways and then expect um, and then expect children to show it in one way. And while it might seem easier to just um, modify assessments per child, I would say that giving children options so that they choose how they want to show it instead of you assuming how they should show it is a better way to teach and for children to learn. You might be surprised that the child you think needs a visual aid to show their answers might decide today that they actually want to explain something. If you give children options, they'll surprise you. Wonderful take to it, ma'am. Giving child the option to choose and also express them in multiple ways would be a great way to go about it, given today's education system specifically. Next, we have a question from Ms. Emilo, who wants to know, how is that we can help children who have very low motivation to study? Because of their inability to perform well in academics, what also happen, happens is their academic performance comes down and also the self-esteem of the child is affected. So what can an educator do to take care of both the academic performance, the motivation, and also the self-esteem component of the child? So first of all, you need, you need to find the one thing, because there's always at least one thing that motivates the child. You need to, and that might be a bit of work, which, in, which involves getting to know the child in front of you. But if you're willing to do that, you will find the one thing that motivates the child. Some children are motivated by verbal affirmations. Some children are motivated by gifts. Some children are motivated by just, you know, giving them tasks and making them feel important. Find what motivates that child and use that as a tool to get them to want to learn. So every time that they do something, every time that they do a task well, you, you give, so it's kind of like a carrot and stick approach. You give them the thing that motivates them and then they feel better about themselves, that improves self-esteem. So it's basically a set of dominoes that just affect each other. Wonderfully put, ma'am. Next, we have a question from Ms. Olum Filmola. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing the name wrongly. The question is because we spoke about assessment using UDL principles. She wants to know, mm -hmm. does any external examination bodies in different countries accept UDL in marking schemes, for exam for children? Could you Let throw some light on it? Absolutely. So if you are in Nigeria, which is what I'm familiar with, if you've ever looked at the West African Senior Secondary Certificate Examination last, you always have one compulsory question that has sub-questions. So there's always the question one, and it has an A, B, C, D, or A1, A2, A3, something like that. And it's always makes, it makes um, provision for there's always, with the aid of a diagram, explain it all, and then there's one C overt. Sometimes it's not always all, it's all always done properly, but the exams make an effort to help you show what you know in different ways. I mean, I will always say that the the presence of options is the only reason I actually was able to pass work and then go on to study law. Fact that there were options and I didn't have to answer all the questions. I just had to pick the one which suited my ability best, which was always the explain. 
or enumerate or elucidate all those ones that required reading and writing. I liked those ones. And I had friends who looked for everything that said with the aid of a diagram. They, they went there first. Everything they said with the aid of a diagram explained, they went there first. But I would always look for anything that gave me room to explain. And it's, it's always there. Thank you so much, ma'am. Next, we have a question from Mr. Che Wong Dogri, who wants to know, what are some tips from your end for teachers who are not trained in handling children with special needs? They're not trained in special education. How is that mm -hmm. they can address children with diverse needs, especially children with different learning challenges? What are your tips for teachers to keep in mind, especially young teachers or a teacher who doesn't have an experience or exposure working in the field of special education? So first thing, like I always say, is that the child is first and first, first and foremost, the child. So never forget that. And if and so treat the child like the child in front of you. You know, keep your eyes open, ask questions if you don't understand, and if possible, have conversations with the parents because the parents know their children best or should. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes grandparents know the children best. I've seen that in experience in Nigeria. But find somebody who knows this child well, especially if the child is nonverbal and can't really tell you much. Find someone who knows the child well so that you can find information about the child. And the reason that you're looking for this information is so you can help the child. And thanks to the internet, places like ability.org, there's information all over the places. So you can always find information to help the child in front of you. And always realize that every child is different. So the fact that you've even worked with the child with special needs before, doesn't mean that you know how to work with this person in front of you. Always treat this child like an individual. Very well put, ma'am. Teaching every child, treating every child as a unique child with their experiences and strengths is very, very important and key to go about it. Next, we have a question from Ms. Al John who wants to know, you mentioned about the four different access points, right? So is mm -hmm. there a way in which all of them can be synchronized to be implemented in a classroom setting? Because there are certain topics in which one or the other style will not be applicable. So what can teachers do on such situations? Uh, I honestly think that there is no topic, if you're going to be creative about it, that you cannot apply all of the styles. I mean, somebody give me a topic that you think they can apply one of the styles to, and I will show you how you can do it. There's a visual element to any lesson. There's an auditory element to any lesson. There's a read and write element to any lesson, and there can be a kind of aesthetic element to any lesson as well. I, I know very many educators who do phenomenal jobs in making almost every lesson kinesthetic, even lessons I did not think you could you could have a practical on. They have a practical way of teaching that lesson. So there, there will be there will be ways. You just have to find it. Thank you so much, ma'am. So I think as teachers, we need to get a little experimental and try and work things out. Next, we have a mm -hmm. question from Ms. Kavya, who wants to know, uh, would, which according to you is one of the best method which would fit for most children in the VARK? That's the question number one. And her other question is, uh, is there any difference in the application of VARK techniques to that of a primary grader and a middle or an elementary school grade child? Mm. So for the first part of the question, none is better than the other, okay? Because they are all valid learning styles. So you actually need to find a way to incorporate at least all four, okay? It's not, there's none better than the other. I mean, I know that people make the unfortunate assumption to say children, so I hear this a lot and it makes me laugh. They say things like children with special needs learn visually. And I laugh because I have cerebral palsy and I do not learn visually people. I'm a read and write learner. So if you come into my class thinking, oh, children with special needs learn visually, and then you start playing me a video, you're going to lose me. So there's, it's not that there's one better than the other. It's that they're all very valid learning styles. And we have to think of ways to accommodate that in the classroom. Now, will VARC look differently in preschool than it will in middle school? Of course. I mean, the activities that preschoolers will do Will completely be different from the activities that middle schoolers or high schoolers will be doing but the principle remains the same 
Thank you so much, ma'am. So understanding the strength and the learning style of the child is very, very important to implementing this per se. So ma'am, there's another question from Ms. Faiga who wants to know how long would it take for a teacher to plan uh, lessons in the UDL principles? So can you give an approximate estimation on how long it would take to plan a whole curriculum? Uh, so do you want a lesson or an entire curriculum? Because an entire curriculum is more than one lesson. I think we could start with the lesson first. Okay. So it depends on how it, it depends on how used you are to it. So I know teachers who will plan a, who will write me a UDN lesson plan. Um, when I do uh, my full day trainings in Nigeria, one of the things that the teachers have to do in that class is to write a UDN lesson plan. And I give them 30 to 45 minutes to write one. And I know teachers who will be done, perfectly done. They would even have incorporated assessment and lesson timelines in less than 45 minutes. So it depends on how used you are to the process of planning a UDL lesson plan. The more you do it, the faster you get. So it's more about practice and yes. that's how they, we'd be able to get a perfect plan for themselves. Next, we have a lot of questions with that of Vilima and multiple others who want to know how can UDL be applied in today's learning settings with that of virtual learning being the most common one that's used. How is that teachers can adapt to accommodate it in their current classrooms? Fantastic. UDL is fantastic for online learning because because you're teaching and learning online, there's already the visual component, right? So you can always think about how to incorporate an auditory component, which is the fact that they're just even listening to you on screen. Um, the read and write component is, is easily the, is, is the easiest thing to use, which is that you can give them a note or you can have them, to, you can have them make up their own notes. And then, of course, there's the kinesthetic component, which is fantastic for assessments or practicals that they have to do, which gets which gets them standing up instead of just sitting in front of the screen all day. So it's it's very very useful in online teaching, and it can actually be the difference between a boring online class and an engaging online class. Thank you so much, ma'am. Next, we have a question from Ms. Roni, who wants to know. The role of parents, because you mentioned about that in the earlier sessions where you spoke about the challenges that teacher face. So what is, is there any specification in UDL about the role of parents in supporting the learning of children? And what is your take on it? How can educators gain in their support of parents to help the child better? Hmm. All right, so UDL is really designed for educators to use in the classroom. But a smart educator knows that parental support is key. So it's important that you find a way to explain what you're doing to parents. Because if parents understand what you're doing, then they can support and then show them ways in which they can support you at home. Something that I have found in my own work is that the teachers and educators and schools that send detailed um, messages home and detailed, say, depending on the child's learning style, detailed assignments that parents need to help with home for the children, find that the parents actually um, are more cooperative and they work better with them. So it's important that as an educator that you don't go over the parents' heads by using a lot of jargon that they don't understand or by just completely um, keeping them out of the loop and the only time they hear from you is during open days or during assessments or during the IEP meetings. Make sure that you're keeping in touch with the parents and you know, giving them simple tasks that they can help with at home and helping them understand why those tasks are important. So it's not just that it's an assignment that the child needs to complete, but that they understand that if they do this with the child, this helps A, B, C, D, E, F. So it's important that as educators, We, we find ways to make sure that we're keeping the parents engaged. Um, and I know that I find very simple things for them to do. One of the things that a lot of Nigerian educators have learned how to do is to use WhatsApp, right? To use WhatsApp to communicate with parents because that they will read on the go. So I know an educator who just sends voice notes. I mean, instead of putting a, 
um, putting a worksheet, or if you put a worksheet in the child's bag, the teacher then goes on to send a voice note to the parents to say, good afternoon, ma'am, or good afternoon, sir. I put so so and so worksheet in your child's bag. Um, this is what I expect to be done to the worksheet, and we expect it to be returned to school on so 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 date. That helped the parents to find a way to be involved and understand what their child's doing. Very, very practical tips on how parents can be educated and being used as a collaborative force to help the child out. Thank you so much for sharing mm -hmm. that about that. Because we're running short of time, I'll take the last two questions for today. One question is from our participant who wants to know, is there any difference between differentiated instruction and UDL? Or are they the same? If you could throw light on it. Okay. Um, UDL is one form of differentiated instruction. So differentiated instruction is the umbrella for all the different ways in which we modify and accommodate lessons. UDL is one form of differentiated instruction. I would just say my preferred form of differentiated instruction. Wonderful, ma'am. The last question that we have for today, because in our topic, we mentioned how is that UDL can be used to be and to become a great teacher. The last question mm -hmm. is from Jory, who wants to know that what, according to you, are the qualities or the characteristics that an effective teacher should have? Right. I believe that my best teachers, my best teachers have been teachers who did a few things right. Number one, they saw me. They didn't just see a disability. Number two, they gave me room to show what I knew in the way that was most convenient for me. So the teachers that gave me options in their exams were the teachers that I loved, not the teachers that just wanted me to draw a diagram. I couldn't draw to save my life. So if the only option to show what I know is a diagram, I'm going to fail. So teachers who gave me options in ways I showed what I knew were the teachers I loved. And the teachers who saw me as a student and really put effort into helping me learn. And so, and so it's always about just making sure that you're giving your children multiple access to um, how many certificates you have and how much education you have. It's really about how much heart that you put into the work because, you know, children know, right? We all know. We know the teachers who truly care and who truly want us to learn and want us to succeed. So it's really about wanting your students to succeed and then going the extra mile to find out what works for each child and helping them use that as a tool for success. What a great message, ma'am. Understanding that each child is unique and understanding where they come from is important and the teachers be believe can create a lot more miracles. Thank you so much, ma'am, for an informative session and making it so, so simple for all of us to understand UDL principles and also put it into practice in all our classroom settings. I'd like to check from you your final thoughts to share with our participants today. All right. I will just say, always make sure that you're teaching the child, not the condition. Because it's very easy to focus on the labels, the disability, the diagnosis, and forget that who is in front of you is actually a child that's here to learn. So always, always focus on the child and not just the condition, because you're teaching the child, not the condition. Thank you. Wonderful note to end it, ma'am. Understanding and teaching the child and not the condition is the key to all educators. I think this would be like the mantra for all of us to follow to become a better educator. Thank you so much, ma'am, for an informative session. And thank you all audience for participating throughout today's session and making it more engaging for all of us. I'd like to reiterate to all of you that you will get, claim, you will get a message to claim your certificate and also like to share with you that we have an upcoming workshop on building comprehension skills in children with special needs happening on the 3rd of February, which would be conducted by Madam Geeta Gopi N. Followed by, we have another workshop which would be conducted by Ms. Shivani Vadva on understanding ADHD in classrooms at home and other settings on the 10th of February. Both of this workshop would be happening at 4.30 p.m. Indian time, 6 p.m. Indonesian time, 7 p.m. Singapore and Philippines time. Don't forget to register yourself and book your slot because we have limited slots available. 
Also, I've seen that the feedback link has already been shared with you all. I request my team member to post the feedback link again. Please do take your moment out and let us know how this workshop has been for you all so that we can improve the experience for all of you. Until we see you for the next time, it's a big bye from Team Ability. Stay safe. Thank you all of you.